welcome everybody. Welcome to the very first inaugural show of WealthWise. I'm Jordan Kimmel and I'm your host. And what we're going to be doing on this show is bringing on top investors, the most well-known investors, the market movers in all different kinds of the markets. So what do I mean by that? Well, my interest is in the stock market and on individual stocks themselves. And I got interested in the market very, very young. I actually highlighted in one of those books over my shoulder, The Magnet Method of Investing. And what happened for me is I was introduced to stocks so young that I, I highlight in the book, my very first stock investment was Heinz Ketchup, Heinz Company. I asked at the dinner table at eight years old, hey, you guys are talking about the markets all the time. Is Heinz a public company? And my parents said, yes, it is. I took all my accumulated life savings of allowances and birthday gifts and whatnot. And I bought, I think, something like 30 shares or eight shares. I don't remember the number of Heinz. Done in a custodial account. Obviously, I couldn't open up my account. But it started a very long adventure. And what happened for me in graduate school, I came across this very simple but extremely powerful concept called the bell curve. And whatever you measure, whether it's the height of buildings, whether it's the weight of human beings, whether it's the actual width of a, a human's hair, there's a bell curve. And inside that bell curve, roughly 80% falls into the middle. And then there's tails. And we don't want to get too deep into the math about the complexities of the tails, but there's winners and losers on both sides of the tail. My question was, as I got a little older and I was studying the markets, why would anybody invest in the market when you can actually figure out which are the better companies and only invest in, in the better companies? As I got a little more experience, we also like to short the other tail, the weak tail. And so I set off on a, on a goal, on a mission, if you will, go to all these places called the money shows and all these conferences and webinars, seminars and whatever I could do. And I always ask the speaker, can I take you to lunch or dinner? What you find, it's amazing how many people come when you offer to pay, even as a young person, the most successful people in life will always make time for ambitious younger people. So when I got to those lunches and dinners, I'd ask two questions. What makes you special? What makes you different? What do you look at? And what two books would you read? And that set me on a journey. And then I'd read the bibliography behind that. And lo and behold, hundreds of investment books. I try to meet every top investor of this era. And what I basically did is I created a model I looked at what the value people were investing in, and they have their own criteria, whether it's price to sales, price to book. I looked at what the growth people were investing in, whether it was growth of revenue, growth of margins, growth of uh, cash flow. And I looked at what the value people look for. Now, I was lucky enough to go to uh, University of Stony Brook out in Long Island and have a professor who was one of the leading leading uh, professors and people in all of chaos theory. If you know, Jim Simons was there, who recently passed. It was an incredible math team there. And turns out the director or the founder, the co-founder of the business school said to me, let's look at what you're doing. This is well after I graduated. We actually wrote the macro of what's called magnet. And it's a blend of value, growth, and momentum. And, and from there, we actually got licensed by one of the largest institutions in the country. And I've set off continuing to try to figure out what makes a great company. Now, what I think makes a great company is what I do. Other people, there's all kinds of ways to approach this market, whether it's long shorting bonds, whether it's dividend growth investing, whether it's sector rotation. So there's a lot of different ways. And the goal of WealthWise is to bring on the leading experts in this generation, let them share what they do as opposed to what I just do. 
And I think that the message is, I know what I do. This is a matter of sharing. It's a matter of really highlighting for other people, whether it's beginning investors or, or deep, deep level investors who've been investing for 20, 30, 40 years like myself. Now, one thing I also want to share is that after I had developed Magnet and it was running for, for many years successfully, there was a financial crisis. We all remember the 07 to 09. And what happened then was there was a bear market that was a breakdown, what I believe was a breakdown in trust. It wasn't like the dot-com era of excessive valuations where even great companies were trading at nutty valuations and dumb companies had been brought to the market. That was the dot-com era. In 07, 08, there was literally a breakdown in Wall Street, a breakdown in trust. So I've been on CNBC and Fox and ABC maybe five, 600 times. One time after another in 07, 08, Big, big companies would come out on Friday evening and say, we're well capitalized. There's nothing to worry about. Over the weekend, would take $5 billion of dilutive capital and the stocks would crash. Well, I said to myself, how can we actually measure if it's a breakdown in trust? Is there any way to literally measure trust? And just like value, growth, and momentum, I said, is there another way to do this? So, so I'm not um, touchy-feely. I'm more of a data person. So we went in and explored, are there any ways, and, and what does trust mean on a corporate level? What's it really all about? And so we sat down with consultants. There were some groups that were measuring corporate governance. There was other groups talking about uh, accounting conservativeness. There was other groups talking about transparency of operations. And being who I like to be, I got them all in a room. And I said, I want to take all of your data. In my prior world, I blended value, growth, and momentum. We're going to now blend taking my original magnet model and bringing in things like accounting, corporate governance, transparency, and sustainability. And we brought a second model out for facts. Fax is currently running as a separately managed account. Many uh, brokerage firms, or RIA specifically, are using the Fax model, which is built on top of Magnet. So that's about who I am and what I do. We are probably, I think, the only, what I found, diversified index running over S&P for the last 12 and a half years. What we found is a low volatility, um, high quality segment of the market, mid cap and large cap. So it's basically magnet with additional filters, you know, placed upon it. So I run everything I do. We have a team of PhDs every week, every day. We're bringing in all kinds of data. I subscribe to probably 10 different services. And then those are blended in to create magnet and fact scores, which is the pool of stocks, so to speak, that I fish from. This is what I do. Um, and, and I actually love it. I, I think the market is a challenge. It's a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and even um, last year, we came out with one more book and it's called Invest in the Now. And we'll talk about that another time. But it's all about not fearing the market, not fearing mistakes, not knowing the future. But if you can actually get enough data on companies, what you're able to do is create this bell curve in the entire market and then down to small cap, mid cap, large cap, down to the sector level. And you know what? There are winners and losers. In the stock market, everyone doesn't get a trophy. Uh, lots of companies go out of business. So in this era where there's an S&P 500, but in that 500, there's only about 25 companies that were actually in this index in the 1970s. 475 new companies. How do you find them? How do you figure it out? We are data people. It's called quant screening. 
it was something that was actually not even available uh, prior to what I was doing because there was no internet. And so Dr. Owen Carroll, who co-founded the Business School of Stony Brook, became my partner, my director of research for the next 15 years. And it's been a lot of fun and I thoroughly enjoy it. So what WealthWise is for, it's for you. It's it'll enable you to ask questions, tell us who you'd like to see. We have access to basically everybody on Wall Street, whether it's from the economic side or whether it's from the stock side, the bond side. We'll have a lot of fun and I'm glad you're joining us. What we'll do right after the break, we're gonna bring on a special first guest it's Reese Williams. He's the chief investment strategist for Wave Capital. And we'll get into how Reese and his firm address the market. I'm sure it's different than what I do. Stick with us. We'll be right back with Reese following this real quick break. Watch 13 WAM News anywhere on any device with STIR. Download the STIR app and choose Rochester. You get local news and more than 20 other TV channels. And the best part? It's free. Go to your app store and download STIR today. Hey everybody, it's Jordan Kimmel, your host on WealthWise. And for our inaugural show, we have a special guest. It's Reese Williams, the Chief Investment Officer of Wave Capital. You see him all the time on the major networks, a veteran and, an, and one of the leaders in the industry. Reese, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm quite honored to be in the inaugural broadcast. All right. Well, let me just say this, Reese. You know, I'll always share, you know, what Magnet's about, my models, what they're about. But there's lots and lots of ways that people address the market. And what I'd like you to do, why don't you share a little bit about the macro picture of, of what you bring, what Wave Capital is about, and we'll drill down into your investment style. Sure, sure. Well, uh, uh, thanks for, as I said, thanks for having me. But Wave Capital is a, um, a diverse far firm that was started by three Duke graduates. Some of us are a little older than others. Uh, the, the, everybody else is 30 something. Uh, so we have a really good mixture of people. And, uh, you know, uh, one person was at, uh, was a lawyer, actually at DLA Piper, and then I was at Intuit. Uh, another person was at CBRE, and the third person worked for Robert L. Johnson's private equity firm. Uh, he was the Black Entertainment Network guy. So a, a really good uh, mixture gotcha. of people and uh, pedigrees. Uh, as opposed to the, as, as on the overall market, um, we, you know, we're fairly constructive on this market. I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, Toby and I and uh, Todd had some great, good dialogues in the re pre previous uh, segment about, about six months ago. We really think this AI thing is for real. Uh, and I think this, that is the leadership uh, for the next several years. And of course, there will be corrections like we experienced a couple of months ago or a month ago now uh, in April. I mean, there will always be corrections in a bull market. Uh, but we still think that theme uh, it just reminds me of the, the kind of the mid 90s when the Internet was ga ga gathering steam. And we still think, you know, the AI part of the markets where there's excitement, there's a bit of hype. The valuations have not gotten silly. NVIDIA, which is sort of the Pied Piper of the internet, uh, excuse me, of the of the AI boom, uh, trades at about 30 times earnings. It's growing more than 100% this year. Cisco, at the at the peak, traded at a, more than 100 times, like 120 right. times earnings, and grew 40%. Uh, and guess what? Cisco had lower gross margins. They had a much worse customer list, meaning Cisco's customers were dependent on the capital markets. And when the capital markets shut down, all the dot com money dried up and they couldn't, you know, they couldn't buy network, uh, so, uh, networking equipment. So uh, it just feels like, you know, at 30 times earnings, the, 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 the leading stock is not saying this is a mania, this is a bubble, this is, you know, we're, we're still well grounded at this point. So we, we like that area. As far as the overall economy, I will say um, things are slowing out there. Uh, and you know, clearly, you have a bit of a, a, a double-edged sword, meaning that 
the top 50% of the income bracket doing pretty well, especially the top 25%. That's responsible for probably 75, 80% of all spending, which is why you know, earnings have been okay, frankly. But little by little, you know, the people are, are getting hurt a little bit at the bottom. And, and we do expect retail sales will will continue to trend lower, meaning the 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 beats are lower. And you think about it, Amazon's doing well, Walmart's are doing well. That sucks up a lot of money. There's a lot of retailers that aren't doing so well if those two are doing well. So um, so overall, we would say the economy's slowing. Interest rates should come down based on that. We expect at some point the CPI actually catches up with reality as rent um, rents come down. You, know, um, you may remember CPI has about a 25 percent um, uh, of the CPI has 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 rent in its calculation, and it's still showing up five or six percent. You can't find an apartment REIT that's charging more uh, up five or six percent year over year. So that's just a, a, a way they calculate it, which is a, a trailing 12 month average still has not fed into CPI. When that happens, it'll help. And I think that's what the market is is starting to predict, which is why utilities have been so strong. So I, I know I've thrown a lot out, out there. Where yeah, where would you like to go? It's it's a great start. So so in terms of your research and the firm itself, what I like hearing is you're talking about companies, uh, not an ETF. Um, and so are you more, you know, for the audience, there's a top down scenario where we're looking at the economy, then we're looking at the sector, and then we're looking at the leading stocks in the sector. Other people are completely bottoms up who just take data and look for companies uh, that are emerging because of revenue or because of margins. That's what I do. I'm more of a bottoms up guy. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so what I think is that the whole message, you know, Reese, that I've Barry, is growth, value, momentum, technicals, and fundamentals. So it's not a matter of what I think is going to happen, but what's happening. And so would you consider yourself more of a technician or more uh, interested in, in, the, in the data of companies? I'm hearing a lot of the, the data side. Yeah, I would say... We, we, we are a bit of a hybrid, meaning we're okay. probably more bottoms up than top down, but we do think there's, a, there's some top down. We do think a little bit about the top down uh, uh, because if you get the top down spectacularly wrong, you're probably not going to get the bottoms up right. Um, so so the, 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 what, but we don't buy a stock just because of our top down thesis. You know, we, we spend time on the industry. We talk to customers, we talk to suppliers, and we tend to buy think, a stock uh, for three to five years. So we're not just techno, you know, technically focused. I mean, okay. I think it, it's great to, to be a, a technician if you're, you know, you're buying the breakout. Walmart broke out today, hooray. I mean, uh, but we've owned Walmart for a long time. Right. Uh, and, and, um, and so I understand that we look at technical analysis, but really we're, we're combining the top down overall macro view uh, with a, a very intensive micro process. Which, frankly, I think is the exact right way to go. And and again, not judging. I let other people do you know what they do. But when you mentioned the few individual companies, I will share with you that we look at something like sixteen different fundamental factors in the technology sector. Nvidia happens to be number one, so of course it's in the portfolio. It's in our index as well. Uh, Amazon and Walmart are also in our index. You know, just what I believe in, Reese, is there's winners and there's losers. So I don't advocate the stock market. I think that what I what happens is there's not more than one percent, literally one percent of companies that can pass through all of our screens. And if they don't have enough revenue growth or their margin's too small or their debt's too large, uh, there's all kinds of ways they get screened. You mentioned some of the winners, but you know what we what we know is in retailers, lots of retailers are going out of business. They're not on the right side of the bell curve. And so I think it's super important that that, you know, when we talk about the market. I always like that expression of an old guy too, that it was a, a market of stocks rather than a stock market. Well, bless you. I, I mean, I think you're on to something. Right. So so let me ask you this. You know, one of the things that I'm not good at, maybe the things that, that I'll, I'll ask for some help on, is seeing around corners. So, you know, again, if you are strictly bottoms up, 
and you're looking too closely at the data and your head's down, you're hit by a truck, right? So the idea is keep your head open. Are there any sectors other than the AI that you'd either highlight or maybe because of, you know, the interest rate environment or anything that you'd be avoiding here? You know, uh, we don't intense, intentionally avoid sectors, but I would say we are underweight uh, consumer names uh, because uh, getting to your point, I think there's just fewer names that will work. And so, you, you, like like I said, Amazon and Walmart, that's probably 40% of all spending. So <laughs> that means everybody else is fighting over, you know, right. 60%. And then you throw in Costco, that you know, that gets you north of 50%, right? So, uh, you know, ev everybody else is fighting for the the table scraps. Um, so I think that's going to be a tough, tough sector. And, and especially because I do see retail sales overall slowing. So uh, assuming those guys continue to execute well, which obviously there's no sign that they aren't, um, right. that just means it tougher for everything else. Um, right. And in terms of healthcare, we're probably underweight as well. The government is super important as a payer. Um, nobody, uh, you know, you think about what drug stocks were like when we were young. Um, right, and, right. and they were amazing stocks, you know, they could raise price and nobody complained about them. And they, mm -hmm. you know, they, you took this pill for Lipitor and you took it every day for the rest of your life and they could charge a lot of money for it. And then, you know, you hit the, this generic wave and, and uh, none of these big companies can, can grow anymore. And, and if they do, Bernie Sanders is going to complain that they're charging too much. So, right. um, so I think that, that, that that's a sector, which is, is just harder. Um, so right. we like to be, in general, not in not big. We, we own a couple of drug companies. One is uh, Eli Lilly, but um, we, we don't want to be in sectors where the government can have a big influence or where the government's going to limit your ability to take price. Right. Well, look, I think the event risk of the big pharma and, and these healthcare providers, you wake up in the morning, they're gapped down and wh whether the administration does anything in the end, the jawboning and the threat of that is important um, to you know to consider. So you know the other thing you were mentioning about the retail side, um, you know, I always said it, I would I love the stock market. You know, rather than taking the big investment and opening up a store, a retail store, could you imagine Reese fighting against the Walmart, fighting against Amazon right now? If you had a hardware store and then Home Depot, you know, showed up. You know, I'd say to people, sell your business in a lot of cases and find the right stocks to buy and and, and you'll find out how much spare time you have. And um, it's just a, a fiercely competitive, uh, you know, world we live in. And, and this brings me, you know, to the next subject is there are people that say, you know, I'm a long term investor in so and so and so and so. And then I bring out Bethlehem Steel. Uh, ninety percent of people who have money in the stock market in the last twenty years has never heard of a company called Woolworths. Mm -hmm. Um, you know they were the largest retailer in the country. People don't even know that name; yeah. they they draw blank on what it is. So the, the idea that I believe in is that new winners emerge, just like sports. Sports have never been bigger. But it's not the same players that were playing from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. There's always new players that come on, um, whether it was Ulta in, in, in the retail area, right. whether, you know, names that, you know, show up. So I want to ask, some people will actually average down in companies. We don't do that. We believe that most companies will die. Um, and we're looking for really the, the, the healthiest names in the market. And that's a big paradox, this idea that the trend is your friend until the end. Or, you know, do you actually rotate? How do you handle that? I think it's a big dilemma. Well, it is. And it's easy to fall in love with a company because you've owned it for a long time and you've done well on, on it. And, and I think the uh, the, what we try to do is, uh, you know, really look where a stock's going, not where it's been. So right. getting back to the, I mean, you know, maybe you bought it at 10 and it's a hundred now, but it, maybe you can go to 200. Um, and, and, and seeming, and also if you bought it at 120 and now it's a hundred, you shouldn't feel like, oh, well, I bought it at 120. I can't sell it here. 
uh, maybe that's the right thing to do. And so, I mean, often, you know, letting your, your letting your winners run and selling your losers is is certainly the approach we take. And and I think that in nine times out of ten, that's probably the right the right thing to do. So it's it's something to consider. And and obviously, well, Woolworths, you had a lot of opportunity to get out of that over time because clearly. You know, it was a dominant retailer at one point, as was Sears Roebuck, by the way, uh, and um, and and you know they were the ones that 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 really d- d- discovered the catalog. I mean, they did. They were they were the Amazon of their generation, really. When you think about all the right. things they did, um, and um, but but they gradually lost their way. And so I think that the the the, the idea is you want to give your company, I think, some room, meaning you can't just sell at the first sign of a little slight hiccup because right, every company right. is going to have a slight hiccup, but you want to make sure there's not a trend that's established. And clearly, you know, Woolworths and Sears started to trend negatively and you right. had probably quite a bit of opportunity to, to, to exit that position when the story had clearly permanently changed. Well, well, Reese, you know, I, we covered a lot of ground already. What I'd like to do is bring you on periodically, whether you're seeing something happening in the sector level, individual stock level. Um, I think this is a great discussion. And you brought up Cisco um, from 2000. I'm going to just mention on the way out here, uh, I believe all Sequoia's trees die. They might live for a long time. But you were probably in the business. Um, you probably knew digital equipment which yep. was a, a leader in there's going to be computers everywhere and went to zero. And Sun Microsystems, the, the theory was this could be all these data centers. And, and then I don't think they're talking about the cloud quite yet, but there was only one leading server company at 90 some odd percent of the market. You couldn't go wrong with Sun, which was eventually sold for a single buck to uh, Alcatel. And uh, so the whole idea, what you're saying is have some conviction, but there's plenty of time. The market will let you out if you keep your eyes open. And um, what I'd like to do, frankly, is uh, get a little closer to the wave capital research you have um, and look forward to having you on again soon. Well, thank you so much. We're excited to be on your inaugural show and I wish you a lot of success. I'm sure it will happen. Well, we'll have a lot of fun together. And uh, like I say, you know, there's all kinds of ways to be in the market. If you think that yours is the only way, you probably stop learning, which is dangerous. So what we're all about here is is really bringing on experts with different walks, different thoughts. And uh, Risha kicked it off beautifully. And I'll say on the way out, it's Jordan Kimmel welcoming the whole audience to Wealthwise. We'll have a great ride together, and we hope you learn a lot and let us know what you're thinking. We'll see you soon.